Honorable. 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 Sharon Knight would be honorable. Um, I had a question that what, I don't want to cut into the time for the people testifying, but uh, if members of the commission have questions for the authors, will they have an opportunity to come up either tonight after the testimony or on another day for us to ask them questions? Because I do have quite a few. I think that this is the most natural opportunity uh, for the kind of discussion that Ms. Treat asked about right here tonight. State Senator John Patrick from Milford. I represent Senate District 18, which is comprised of 30 towns in western and northern Oxford County and the town of Livermore, Livermore Falls, and Andrew Scoggin Town. Good evening and welcome. My name is Craig Hickman. I represent District 81, which is Winthrop, Greenfield, and a part of North Mountain, which is part of Mount Pisgah. And I reside in Winthrop. Good evening, everyone. My name is Joel Case. I'm an emergency physician. I'm Christy Daggett. I'm the Senior Manager of Workforce Development at the Arista County Action Program. Uh, I work in Presque Isle. ACAP covers all of Arista County. And I'm here representing an economic development organization. I'm John Palmer. <coughs> I'm John Palmer from Oxford. I represent a small business. Hi, Sharon Treat, I represent environmental groups on the uh, CTEC, and I professionally work for several different environmental groups and consultants. I'm Representative Stacy Garen. I represent District 102, Glenburn, Oban, and Kendeston, which is just outside of Bangor. Okay, thank you, everybody. And um, some, some, of, some of you traveled for long distances, so appreciate you coming. <laughs> Um, so, I guess, Luck, if you'd like to um, come forward and give us a history of the CTTC and also how uh, we come about having this assessment in front of us. Sure. Again, my name is Locke Kiermaier. I am the staff person for the Citizen Trade Policy Commission. And to give you a brief history of the CTPC, the legislature established uh, in law the Citizen Trade Policy Commission in 2003. And I, I think it was, I think it's fair to say that it, to a large extent, the legislature felt that there was a need to create this kind of commission after what happened, um, the experience that the state had with NAFTA. And I think that uh, the legislature felt that we needed that some kind of organized uh, official commission was needed to monitor what was going on with free trade agreements and how they might affect the state of Maine. So the Citizen Trade Policy Commission has been meeting uh, since 2003. It's uh, composed, as you can see, of legislators and uh, different representatives of particular constituencies across the state. It's intended to be broadly representative and nonpartisan or bipartisan. Uh, and as part of its charge, when the legislature established the CTPC, 
They also established and required the CTPC to commission a, an assessment every two years of a pertinent uh, free trade agreement topic. Now, the CTPC has a very broad latitude in statute to decide what they want, what you want uh, the assessment to concern with, and who do you want it, who do you want to do it. Uh, the legislature, I should mention also, appropriates $10,000 every two years for this purpose. Exactly that amount, no more, no less. So that's um, the money that the commission has to work with to try to find a suitable author or authors to do the assessment. This year's assessment, um, the process that we went through was that we gathered suggestions as to potential authors from members of the commission. After a, we, we gathered a bunch of names or groups or organizations that might be possibilities, those four, those, the, that, that list of possible authors was narrowed down by the chairs to four um, organizations which were invited to submit a proposal as to well, you know, what they would propose to do for the assessment. Uh, so we invited four people, and the invitation is very broad. We didn't specify a topic other, we suggested that it might, given all the attention and the imminency of uh, the Trans-Pacific Partnership, it was suggested that the assessment this year might well deal with that. Um, and most of the proposals we got did deal with that. Uh, out of the four organizations that we invited to submit proposals, only two decided to take us up on that invitation. And the commission, after hearing and reviewing the, different, the two different proposals that we received, uh, voted unanimously to accept the proposal from the Margaret Chase Smith Policy Center at the University of Maine. And uh, Phil, Professor Phil Trostel and Kate Riley DeLudio, okay, got that right, um, are the authors of this year's assessment. So uh, we, had a, we have a specific timetable in mind. Uh, the contract that we have with Phil and Kate specifies that they would had to submit a draft assessment on September 1st, which we posted immediately on the CTPC website. It's a downloadable version, a PDF document, which is accessible to everyone. The contract further states that the, a public hearing to gather reaction, both pro and con, to that draft assessment would be held on this date, September 15th, based on what the authors hear during this public hearing, they may choose to incorporate or change the draft in whatever way they think is appropriate, but that decision is up to them. Finally, based on what their final decision is, how they want the assessment to look, uh, they will submit a final version of it by contract on September 30th. So, are there any questions that I could answer easily, or maybe even hard questions? But that's just a brief run through of the CTPC and the assessment process. Any questions from anyone? I don't see any, thank you. Okay, I would ask, um, we have a sign-in sheet here and it's very important uh, that whoever gets, to test, gets up to testify, if you'd please fill this out and write legibly uh, so that I can uh, accurately record who testified here. So thank you. Thank you, Bob. Thank you. All right. Kate Deludio, I'm going to walk through this um, report. 
very briefly. Phil is here to answer questions as well at the end. Um, uh, what we proposed in our um, proposal, which Locke mentioned, was to lay out kind of the, the economic evidence related to trade uh, in general and the TPP more specifically as they relate to Maine. Um, so that's what we tried to do in this report. There are very complex issues, and we know that there's uh, legitimate views on all sides of this. What we were doing was using an academic lens to look at for kind of the evidence-based research um, on these issues as they relate to trade's economic impact. So we didn't look at other impacts like geopolitical, social impacts. So we were really looking specifically at economic impacts. Um, so the report starts with kind of a history of economic theory as it relates to international trade, starting with mercantilism back in the 17th century, um, the thinking that exports are good, all imports are bad, moving to comparative advantage in the 18th century where countries realized that they, where there were opportunities for mutual gain through trade, um, to the broad consensus today among um, most economists that trade benefits societies as a whole, um, but there are concentrated losses that fall disproportionately on certain groups of workers or industries um, or regions. And there's also broad consensus that um, as a society, it's, mm, it's cheaper to compensate and assist those individuals directly um, rather than foregoing the, uh, the opportunities afforded by trade, by kind of just opting out of it. Um, then we discuss the history of trade policy broadly. Again, in general, in the last century in the US and around the world, there's been a liberalization of trade. Um, there was a spike in protectionism in the, during the Great Depression. Um, but after World War II, um, since that protectionism had only worsened the situation, um, countries got together um, and agreed to, um, broadly agreed to continue liberalizing trade, and we've been on that trajectory ever since. Um, trade really picked up in the 1970s. Um, it was, uh, trade represented about 5% of world GDP in the 70s, and today it's up to 30%, so a real increase. Uh, free trade agreements are only partly responsible for that. Globalization in general has increased trade. Uh, advances in transportation, technology, communications, um, there's a whole kind of list of things in the report. Um, development in low-income countries, that's very important as well. So all these things have kind of coalesced to really increase the amount of trade that's been going on. The impact of consumers, which we highlight in the report, um, has been to considerably lower the cost of goods um, that most U.S. consumers consume. Um, you know, if you go into any household or store, it's uh, a showcase of goods from around the world that we just didn't have 50 years ago. On average, um, one study finds that trade has, uh, or lowers the cost for U.S. consumers on average by 8% for most of the goods they consume. But for low-income countries who spend, or sorry, low-income households who spend a disproportionate part of their income on food and clothing, which are highly tradable, the gains are even greater, maybe according to one study up to 60%. So consumers gain. Um, the impact on U.S. workers overall, we see again increases, um, increases in service jobs, uh, now that people have more money for services, increases in uh, more innovative and export-oriented industries, and decreases in employment in industries that are import-sensitive, particularly manufacturing, which um, we discuss and is, is pretty well documented. Demand for low-skilled workers, especially in manufacturing, has declined as there's been more competition from low-wage countries. Um, demand for high-skilled workers has um, held steady and increased, so we've there's seen a kind of a disparity in that. And there's a well-documented um, stagnation of average wages since the 1970s. And there's kind of an, an active research effort to parse out what that is from, but certainly part of it, um, although certainly not all of it, would be due to increased trade. Section two of the report talks about Maine's economy since NAFTA. We used 1994 as a benchmark for looking at how um, trade has impacted Maine recently. 1994, of course, was the first year of NAFTA. 
And we see, again, that Maine has grown overall by many economic measures, including household income, GDP, employment, exports. Um, but growth has been uneven across regions and industries, which we discuss in the report. In general, there's been a shift from manufacturing to services, um, which has occurred across the U.S. And, and definitely predates NAFTA. Maine has lost uh, hundreds of thousands of manufacturing jobs, although manufacturing is still a large, um, a sizable industry, it employs about 10% of the workforce. Um, the remaining manufacturing jobs uh, generally, uh, according to the Department of Labor in Maine, require um, higher skills, more technology, um, they're even better paid you know, than they were in the past. So more or less, manufacturers who are reliant on low-skilled wages, oh, sorry, low-skilled workers, um, most have either closed or invested heavily in technology to become more efficient. Um, service, the service sector in Maine has grown as manufacturing has declined. Um, growth since 1994 equals the entire goods producing uh, sector of the economy in 1994. So you can imagine the entire goods producing sector of Maine's economy, we've had that much growth just in services since then, even as manufacturing has declined. Um, about two thirds of service sector jobs are in medium and high income uh, professions, business, uh, education, healthcare, and about one third are in lower wage professions such as uh, retail, trade, and food services. So we discuss these changes because these are structural permanent changes and they affect how Maine will react to future free trade agreements. Um, we say in one part, put simply, Maine can't lose the same jobs twice. So although these transitions have been um, painful, um, they, they've happened. Um, and so we needed to kind of lay that out to address how now Maine is, given its current economic structure, how would it react to a future increases in trade? The third section starts to get more specific, talking about the TPP, just kind of outlining what it's about. The TPP is a free trade agreement between 12 Pacific Rim countries, six of which the U.S. already has a free trade agreement with. So um, when you add the U.S. to those six countries, that accounts for about 80 percent of the economic activity in the TPP region. So 80% of the economic activity is already covered by a free trade agreement. This free trade agreement would add on another 20% um, by adding five countries to the, to the number that US, the US has a free trade agreement with. Of those five, Japan is the largest. Um, it's about the size of Mexico, and it has income about equivalent to the European Union. So it's um, kind of a middle income country. They're, um, uh, economy has been uh, lagging, stagnant, I guess, in recent years. It's not doing well, um, but it's still large, and they still have relatively high incomes compared to other parts of the world. Malaysia and Vietnam are um, two other important opportunities or markets in the TPP region of new FTAs because they, again, they're large. They're about the same size as Japan when you combine them, and they are fast growing. They're also significant because they're relatively low-wage countries, so that plays into kind of what we're talking about, about competition with low-wage countries. The TPP would eliminate tariffs on about 80% of traded goods between the TPP countries immediately, and it would eliminate 99% um, in 30 years. So those tariff reductions are the historic core of FTAs free trade agreements, and the TPP, um, like other used recent free trade agreements, would kind of go beyond those tariff reductions to more kind of new trade issues, such as uh, labor standards, environmental standards, um, digital trade, trade secrets, financial services, um, all of those which, which we mention in the report but don't go into a great amount of detail in. These appear to be attempts to update free trade agreements to uh, the new kind of reality of global businesses and to address some shortcomings of past FTAs. And so the bottom line with those new provisions is that they're very difficult to protect, predict kind of what the impact will be because they are in fact new and essentially impossible to quantify so we did not try to, to quantify the impact of those in, these, in this uh, report. Section 4, uh, the TPP's impact on the U.S. 
the in that section and the appendix, we summarize the results of eight uh, studies on the TPP's potential economic impact done by um, U.S., Japanese, and World Bank economists. And in general, they find um, neutral or slightly, meaning less than 1 percent, positive impacts on U.S. Uh, GDP, employment, and wages. And several of them note the likelihood of smaller concentrated losses in um, you know, specific import sensitive areas or groups of workers like we've seen in the past. The US ITC assessment, um, the US International Trade Commission, I think, um, their assessment, which is what we based the main assessment on, estimates that the TPP's impact in 2032 would be to increase US GDP by 0.15 percent, increase employment by 0.7 percent, and increase real wages by 0.19 percent. So these are very small um, increases. Section 5 is where we get into the impact on Maine. So using the USITC study, we extrapolated the potential impact on Maine. Um, we use that study because it is the most thorough. It is, um, uses a very, an academically respected methodology, and it provided the most detail across economic sectors so we could get the most information from it. We based main projections on Maine's share of U.S. economic activity in recent years. So, for instance, if Maine averaged 1 percent of GDP, U.S. GDP, um, in recent years, we would expect that Maine would experience 1 percent of the GDP impact of the um, TPP. And we calculated that percentage based on whatever variable we were looking at, whether it was employment, wages, exports. Um, we could not do that for imports and service exports because that data is not available at the state level. And we also couldn't do it for many of the smaller sectors, such as in agriculture um, and manufacturing, for a couple reasons. Either in some cases Maine didn't have that sector, like we don't have a rice sector, um, or the sector is so small that some of this information wasn't disclosable um, for proprietary reasons, or um, often it was included in a larger category and we couldn't at the state level piece out kind of which, which industry was which. It was aggregated up to another level. So this approach assumes that the main U.S. ratio of economic activity in 2032 is the same that it's been in recent years. And that uh, will probably not be the case. But um, making any projections about how it's going to change would have included or required a lot of additional assumptions and subjectivity um, and a lot of imprecision. And so we chose the, the route of maximum transparency and minimum assumptions. Um, and so as you're looking at these, I would just say that these shouldn't be interpreted as precise predictions. They are, um, they give a sense of the general magnitude and direction of impacts. So using this methodology, um, we found that the TPP's likely impact on Maine in 2032 would be to increase real income by $163 per capita. So that includes increased wages and increased savings from um, lower cost goods through imports. Uh, it would increase real GDP by $106 and increase employment by $554 full-time equivalent positions. So overall, again, small gains. Um, at the sectoral level, there will likely be increases uh, or increased growth in agriculture and services. Services in this study, the USITC study, includes construction, wholesale retail trade, healthcare, education, and business services, and slightly slower growth in manufacturing, although not absolute declines, just slower growth. Um, a few notes on specific sectors. One, seafood. Um, the US ITC estimated that seafood imports, uh, mainly from Japan, Malaysia, and Vietnam, would increase under the TPP um, and slow the growth of overall US seafood output. But it would increase US seafood exports. So judging how this would affect Maine, um, because of Maine's strong track record in exporting <coughs> lobsters, uh, it could probably benefit that industry, which is what some folks in the industry have said, and that's been the case of the US FTA um, with Korea. 
tourism, uh, one thing to explain in that result is that USCIC predicts that um, due to increased wages, or rather incomes from the TPP, it would slightly increase the amount of travel that U.S. residents would do, and some of that would be international. So in their accounting, that's going to show up as a loss for the U.S. So based on our methodology, that also shows up as a loss for Maine. However, if people are traveling more and Maine is a travel destination, it seems logical that they would probably benefit Maine, not hurt it. Um, USITC also predicts um, slightly slower growth in paper and wood products, uh, which would also translate to slower growth in Maine. Um, and one note there is that their definition of that paper category also includes publishing, which isn't significant in Maine. It's about 10% of that industry, but nationally it's about 40%. And we couldn't tell whether the um, reduction in growth was coming from the publishing side of things or the paper side of things. So that's just something to be mindful of in that. Um, and that's all I have. Did you want to add anything? I think that was great. Okay. All right. Thank you. Nothing to add, Mr. Trussell? No. Nope. So I know that um, the street has some questions. <laughs> Does anyone else have any questions? Um, mm -hmm. uh, uh, okay. Well, thank you very much. It's a huge piece of work here. Um, and with that said, though, I do have some concerns about it in that I think that there's a number of areas where um, I guess I had thought um, the report would go into some detail, less about the history of the world of trade and more about what the implications for the state of Maine might be. And there's a couple of places, well, there's a number of areas where it seems to me that there's quite a bit of published literature that provides some of that detail and um, generally goes in the direction of not painting quite as rosy a picture as the overall uh, picture that's painted in this report. And I just wanted to go through a few of those areas. One of the first ones, because we, we actually did a, had a report done on this to some extent two years ago, on, was dairy. Um, Dairy is in a very precarious position in the state already. Uh, we have an in-state uh, program that helps provide payments to dairy farmers to help maintain those farms right now. Basically, my understanding, and I know some of this, and I know I'll be corrected by uh, Representative Hickman, but I sat through an hour plus presentation by the Dairy uh, Association before the Ag Committee this year um, going through some of this. So one of the things in your report um, says that the TPP will increase imports of dairy by 20%, which is quite a significant number. And what we learned two years ago in that report, which I know was shared with you, is that the, the price for dairy is based on um, a number of factors, but it would include um, those imports. And in fact, and again, I saw in here that uh, um, there's a very slight increase in U.S. production. That also would not necessarily help Maine. Uh, and again, that's my big picture understanding of the dairy issues, but I, I'm pretty sure that the commission specifically asked um, you to look at dairy as one of the areas um, because we had sort of gotten alarm bells about that. And I know that nationally even, uh, and again, this is a Maine-centric point of view, but nationally, I know the dairy groups are somewhat split uh, on uh, their position on the TPP because of this very factor. So that's one thing, and I know that there's a lot of, there's research that was already done for the commission uh, in the previous assessment in 2014. I know that um, there's also a lot of analysis about dairy specifically and what's going on right now. Uh, uh, that the um, Institute for Agriculture and Trade Policy has done. Full disclosure, I'm done consulting for them, but that's one reason I know about this, um, um, these studies. So that's one area that, um, you know, I'm just surprised there wasn't more, and I didn't know you, it's not really a question, but it could be a question if, if you would like to respond to that or, or explain more what is in the paper. 
No, I mean, what we proposed was a broader look across many sectors. I actually don't remember specifically being asked about dairy, to be honest. Is it anyone else? <laughs> well, dairy but, is one of the sectors that's protected. But that is one of the yeah on the sectors that we were able to look at. Right, and, but, and I'm just suggesting that saying that imports are 20% and not going beyond that when we have specific information that's already been prepared for the commission on that issue, um, wouldn't it have been too difficult? And so maybe this is something that could be looked at you know, when, for the final mm -hmm. report. Um, a second issue is ISDS. Um, this has been a huge issue in terms of the testimony before the commission. Uh, over the years, uh, the commission has written numerous letters um, raising concerns about it. And this is another area where I, I think this report takes at face value certain statements by um, U.S. Trade Representative and other organizations that are very, um, have a position that's very much in support of trade agreements generally, which is fine, except that there are alternative points of view about this and analysis, some by very well-respected law professors, uh, which have looked at the ISDS provisions and the investment chapter provisions of um, the TPP, and say, they say that contrary to the um, statements by USTR, that um, ISDS has sort of been fixed and reformed, and so the concerns that we had uh, have expressed over the years about the, um, the conflicts of interest, the, the you know, secrecy, um, the uh, loose uh, kind of legal standards, the lack of precedent, uh, many other things, those things are not addressed in those reforms and, that, and some of these law professors, uh, and I can certainly share with you um, the sort of the key thinkers on this, but mm -hmm. um, one um, is uh, people at the uh, Columbia Law School have written a very detailed article about that, uh, among others, basically saying that the changes are fairly cosmetic and I would just say that, and in addition, that the investment chapter, rather than being narrowed, has actually been expanded so that um, challenges that could not have been brought before or that perhaps weren't clearly within the ambit of the investment chapter, such as challenges to um, decisions not to grant a patent to a medicines, as in Canada, in this recent case with Eli Lilly, have now been expanded. Uh, uh, very explicitly included in the investment chapter. So the, invest, the ISDS provisions actually cover, those cases cover more. Um, there's many, many more companies that could use it. And um, there's been quite a bit of analysis really digging down as to whether the statements of USTR that they have really improved that um, ISDS um, that say they haven't. And one of those actually is from the Intergovernmental Policy Advisory Commission, which is the committee that advises USTR, it's cleared advisors representing state and local government. And, and that, they came out with a report that's several pages just on ISDS explaining why, in their opinion, it did not really address those issues. So again, these are some reports that I would be happy to share with you. Mm -hmm. um, and they are, that is a government report, so if, if you are limiting yourself to government reports, that is one that I think should have been considered. So- I'd have to look at it, yeah. Yeah, so that's the second issue. I mean, again, I don't, I, I don't wanna go on too long, but these, these are just some of the issues. Um, you made a statement here today, and it's all in your paper as well, that disruptions uh, of people losing their jobs uh, basically are dealt with by um, assistance in getting new jobs, but when I read your paper, what it said was that that Trade Act assistance actually didn't cover much, and basically these people have ended up getting welfare benefits as a result. Uh, and that wasn't really explored, and I don't think that you really went into the um, employment issues in, in the way that you could have. Um, we, we have some testimony that was emailed to us by the folks at um, the Tufts uh, University that had done a report that your report says basically couldn't pass peer review. Um, 
they take issue with that, and I guess I am in agreement with them. I think that their rebuttal is something that you need to see, and, and that, is, that information has been public before uh, when uh, their report was criticized. And that is the report that looks at what the employment impacts are, as opposed to all these other economic reports, which sort of assume that everyone who gets unemployed gets a job later. And we know here in Maine that they may eventually get a job, but generally it's not a job that pays the same wages. Uh, and you know, to say you can't lose the same job twice, in fact, people I used to represent lost different jobs repeatedly, all because of trade. So I, I think that you know, some of the same people are being impacted. And I would have liked to have seen some more on that, and in fact, there are reputable studies by economists and supported by even Pulitzer Prize winning econ economists like Joseph Stieglitz that look at those issues uh, in, in a little more, with a little more nuance, I guess I would say, than what's in this um, report. May I comment on that? Yeah. Uh, how familiar are you with uh, Timothy Wise? Um, I just know of the papers that come out of his, uh, of, from Tufts. So that, he that, submitted um, testimony tonight. Mm -hmm. that, that organization at Tufts is the Global Development and Environment Institute. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, well, Mr. Wise uh, does not have a degree in economics. In fact, he doesn't have a PhD. And uh, if you go to their website, the Global Development and Environment Institute says they do applied research on the effects of economic policies using an analytical framework that assesses the limitations of market mechanisms. And we believe the theory as presently taught by most economists and policies that proceed from it are not sufficiently oriented to improve human well-being, which is a nice way of saying they are what used to be referred to as Marxist economists. Or later referred to as radical economics. And there were a few economics departments around the country that were nothing but radical economists who believed that the market, the capitalist system is bad, period. Now, mainstream economists are aware that markets don't work very well in many ways, uh, but we don't take as gospel that capitalism is evil. So this organization is publishing research that no mainstream economist would agree with. And I am a mainstream economist, so this research is blatantly re misleading. I could go into the details about it, but the bottom line is that if the U.S. were in a recession, their model suggests that we would never come out of it. The Great Depression, we never should have come out of it. Every recession, we never should have come out of it because they assume once someone loses a job, they're always unemployed. I'm sorry, but that research that is published, and they mentioned one journal that published one of their articles uh, prior to the TPP. Um, I never heard of it. Uh, I looked up a list of economics journals. This is called Economia e Lavoro. Uh, it doesn't show up as a list on the list of economics journals. So this is not mainstream research. They also point out that uh, Joseph Stiglitz, a Nobel laureate in economics, praised this Capaldo et al. study. He, if you go back and look at the video, he mentions an offhand comment, one sentence, saying that he thought that Capaldo <coughs> was probably right, meaning he never actually read the study. He, so he heard the results. He hasn't read the study. I would bet my house he hasn't read the study. And if he had read the study, I would bet my house he would say, this is bogus. Okay. Regardless, I would just say this, that to have an economic study that does not consider unemployed people actually staying unemployed for a period of time that isn't brief is, and I'm a layman, obviously I'm not an economist, but that is making an assumption, and you said you're light on assumptions, but it is making a major assumption that in my view undermines <coughs> the conclusions of your report. And I would just put it at that, and I don't think that the Capaldo study is the only one, and I also think calling, you know, other academic socialists is not 
maybe a productive way of Thank you. I'd like to remind um, people here, you're, you're welcome to be here as members of the public, but um, we'd ask that you remain in order, so we, are, we do not have clapping or, or any other noise. Um, you'll note that none of the members of the commission are going to have that kind of behavior. Let's remain professional, please. Thank you. I'm sorry that I still have several other issues, but I, if there's other committee members, you know, I, I would like to respond to one point you mentioned. Yeah. Um, there is really good economic research about the long-term impact of trade, especially in some reason, regions with the concentration of heavy industry. And David Otto at uh, MIT is a guy who's doing really good work with that, and we cite him several times in this. So I think maybe you should just take another look at that. dangled out there that there may be some changes uh, before that vote occurs, if it ever does actually come. <clears throat> so my question is whether you might know what those proposed changes would be and whether they have any effect on the analysis that you provided. I don't. I'm sorry. We've been focusing on the TPP as uh, been as the written. possibility of uh, expanding the fee size ISDS get a little more detail to that. It is something that we followed very closely. The changes in that are important. Um, whether they're effective or not is a question, and I don't know if that's within your discipline or not. It's definitely not. We're not really. Um, but we'd be happy to look at anything. I've read what Sharon sent. Um, she sent some articles about ISDS, and there's at least one piece in there I think we should add, talking about how the EU is looking at setting up an alternate system to ISDS. So if there's stuff that you think we should save, you have to look at it. One of the statements you made that I was really interested in um, has to do with the fact that it looks like the job loss trend in Maine may be coming to an end. And the, I guess my question is what lies beneath that? Is that because we've already lost a lot of our major manufacturing jobs? Was there something more? We have lost tens of thousands of manufacturing jobs. And the Maine Department of Labor has done a couple of really good reports on that, looking at who is remaining. And they found, like I mentioned, that the, the manufacturing operations that are still in existence um, have learned how to compete internationally. I mean, they're not immune to international competition. Obviously, we've got New Balance. You know, it's a great example of it. But in general, um, Anyone who was reliant, as I said, on low-skilled wage uh, war, labor, um, either has closed or has invested in technology to upgrade, and that's kind of one of the points there. But even with that, and even without the TPP, um, the main DOL still projects some manu some losses in manufacturing. It, it, so we haven't bottomed out, I would say. Are you it, referring to manufacturing specifically? Are you referring to manufacturing jobs specifically? Uh, well, well, in terms of job loss, it, this is not a state that, that has a lot of um, diversity in the employment areas. It's been so that the loss of jobs in many of the in the woods and also in the in the um, working mills areas have been hard. Well, I want to stress what Kate said is that job losses are going to continue in Maine and in the United States. Uh, that's just the inevitable consequences of how labor markets work. There's always going to be job losses, and new jobs get created. Uh, so I don't think it's accurate to say that you're predicting the end of job losses. Uh, that we're not saying that at all. Uh, as far as overall manufacturing employment, the USITC 
see manufacturing and employment increasing very slightly. Is that right? Yeah. I, mean, well, I know output is supposed to increase slightly, employment less so. But yeah. as a share of the economy, both of those are projected to become smaller, right. both in Maine and in, in the United States. So does that clarify your it's question? Does. My sort of bottom line question to you is, it, 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 is this a substantial piece of work? I enjoyed reading it. Um, I was surprised there weren't more typos or things like that in the, in the draft. We have, uh, I proofread things for part of my job, so maybe that's a particular tilt of time. But I'd like to ask you if, I, did I read correctly that essentially your conclusion as far as the impact of the TPP on Maine is that there's possibility of a slight benefit to us, but there will be pockets where it will be considerably less. We didn't write a conclusion. Um, I think that's a fair summary of what the, the final section of the report says. I think it's a, a fair summary of the final section of the report. Um, I would say that if we thought it was only about the bottom line number of jobs and whatnot, you know, we could have written a five-page report. The reason that we try to touch on a lot of those other issues is because it is complex. Um, but as far as is what we found using the methodology I described. Um, yes, I think that's a, a good summary. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. I, I would want to add uh, the USITC study predicts very small gains. These are really small gains. And there's strong theoretical reasons for that. As Kate mentioned earlier, 80% of what is supposed to be the TPP is already governed by free trade agreements with the United States. And the tariffs on the remaining countries are not terribly high, so there's just not a lot that the TPP can do to generate big gains or th there will be some additional losses and they will be very concentrated. There are going to be some small segments that are going to be hit hard and that's the nature of economic change. Well, and I think you've said numerous places that the report that there are always other factors at work that will not necessarily be taken into account. Um, other changes in the world, um, what's happening with China, um, what, how China has impacted our economy, what might happen in the future with China, and how that will impact our economy. A lot of those things will have, have an effect on the bottom line. I'm just asking in terms of um, this, this assessment. So that's helpful. Thank you. I believe that we have um, Dr. Case had a question, and then Representative Aaron also had a question. I'm not sure which was first. <laughs> She's right there, so why don't we? Well, I I just had kind of a point of order. I where this was advertised as a public hearing. I thought maybe we could hear from the folks out there. We're an hour in at this point, and then if members of the committee had further questions and there was time they could ask them or we could submit them in writing because we, we have the ability to get the answers back. Yes? Um, I would just say I, I support that but I don't support submitting them in writing. I, I really would like to have an opportunity to ask the questions of the authors but I don't want to hold up um, you know the testimony. So you know, because this is our only opportunity to have that back and forth. Right. Uh, are, are the two of you on any particular time constraint this evening? No. No? Okay. So this is what I would suggest, that you seem to have a lot of questions. Mm -hmm. There are members that have long distances they need to drive. So what I would suggest is perhaps um, if, if anybody else, Dr. Case, I know had a question, if any other members have questions, um, and then we can do the public, and then you could you could take some time to do your questions. Okay. It's like being on a talk show or something. <laughs> <laughs> I will, <love> Brock. <laughs> Thank you uh, for all of the work that you have put in, into this. Um, while I, I agree with uh, my uh, colleague, the Honorable uh, Ms. Tree, in that there are some areas that I would like to see some more detail, uh, specifically related to what's going on in Maine, recognizing that, that assumptions have to be made and that's hard to do. 
Um, however, I very much enjoyed um, the introductory piece, uh, the historical perspective, because I think that looking at what's going on right now in the context of how things have developed not only over the last few decades, but literally over the last few centuries, really helps inform um, some of our decision making as, as we are thinking about future policy. Um, so thank you for that work. I, I did very much appreciate that perspective. That being said, I, I think one of the things that we have to consider is that some of this is so unknown. There were driverless cars taking people uh, for taxi rides. So we are now in the era of automated automobiles. I can't even imagine what that's going to mean for all kinds of sectors of the economy in the next decade. And it's going to change very rapidly. And that's the other piece. In the two decades since NAFTA, things seem to have changed very rapidly. But I guarantee what's going to happen in the next decade, we will see more rapid change in the next 10 years than we likely have seen in the last 50. So I don't even know that the way we look at things, the way we have the ability to do studies, I don't know that we can even account for how do we figure out what's going to happen in 32 years. So that all being said, um, the one real question I have for you is, you talked about, um, in Maine specifically, uh, with the transition uh, of Maine moving from um, an economy where we make things to an economy where we provide services. Um, a third versus two-thirds of those jobs currently, uh, two-thirds being in the medium to, to high paying uh, sectors, like education, healthcare, uh, and a third being in the lower paying sectors. I'd like to look at that a little, a little bit more in depth and, and understand, is that, per, is that ratio, uh, are, is that where we should be? Is that where we have to be? What does that look like relative to other states that have some of the overwhelming issues that, that we have struggled with um, in terms of the, the loss of jobs um, in the um, manufacturing sector that we've seen, or are we not doing as well as other similar states? Um, or if we look at states like California and New York and Florida and Arizona, do they have that same one-third, two-thirds ratio? And once we look at that, what are the things that we can do as policymakers to get that ratio where it really needs to be if that's not where it needs to be. And maybe you're going to tell me that, wow, that's actually a really good ratio. That's not a bad ratio. But, but that's more of the information that I think might be helpful for us, um, specific to me as we move forward. I probably shouldn't venture a guess, but I do remember looking at, I, I, I think, and Phil, correct me if I'm wrong, I think that Maine's ratio, that one-third is a bit higher. Um, because we're not high income state and we've got a lot of tourism, um, you know, tourism sector jobs, which tend to be retail, you know, food service. Is that? That's correct. And yeah. the, the big driver there is education attainment. Yeah. States like New York and California have more education attainment, so their proportion of higher paying service jobs versus the lower paying service jobs is reflected in that. So again, in terms of informing policy making, um, you, know, you could extrapolate uh, very broadly 
that if we put more resources into making sure that our young people were uh, had better opportunities for education here in the state, that that in turn could potentially impact that ratio. Um, and as we all know, um, you know, the cities right now where they have seen significant increases uh, in their um, employment rates, decreases in their unemployment rates, um, the numbers have been good, but the vast majority of those jobs have been low-paying jobs. So does that have as much value as, as we would hope for? Is that a question? <laughs> Is, is there any uh, inflationary factor that figures into the potential of $163, $165 gain by uh, 2032? Because I, I, I'm, I'm looking at it from the standpoint, I live in Oxford County, and in my lifetime we have lost 54 or more manufacturing plants. In the one-third that of the low wage earners who used to be in manufacturing, does does that factor in any inflationary factor to find the, the, the necessary gains that supposedly the two thirds have gained? Because I I look from a from a standpoint of reality, I, I go door to door and 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 see what people are doing, and and from my standpoint, from my section of Maine, and I'm a rural Mainer, uh, I think were adversely affected compared to uh, urban areas like Portland South and stuff like that. So I'm, I'm kind of looking at from the standpoint of supporting the TPP or not. Uh, I look at all of these economic factors that go into all these studies. And I used to sit next to Dick Woodbury for a couple of years or four years and stuff. And, and I, I look at some of the things he and I talked at. The benefits to the one-third of the bottom, to me, uh, are, are, are what I look at is the overall health of Maine in the one-third, if it's the one-third, two-thirds uh, from, the, from the standpoint of across America, because it's that one-third, if we're a uh, consumer-driven economy, if one-third of a society can't even buy the cheap junk from China, in Mexico and Indonesia and all these other companies, we're, we're going to go downhill a lot faster. So I'm wondering, is, is there any inflationary factors that have figured into all these different computations that come up with all of these reports? Uh, well, in USITC, that's adjusted for inflation. So you can think about that in, in today's dollars. Um, and those are overall numbers. So beneath them will be some losses and gains. No one's going to get a check for $163 in 2032. Um, and, but I think what you're seeing, um, for better or worse, I would expect uh, to see more of that. You would see, um, you know, we, we charted out job growth in Maine by region, separating out Portland, Bangor, Lewiston, and then the rest of Maine. That's on page 28 if you have the big one. But you can see that the job growth has been in the metropolitan areas, you know, and it hasn't in, in the rest of Maine, it's been flat. Um, so what you've seen is exactly what we're talking about, that these, um, you know, it's hard to quantify if I save $20 on a sweater or $5 here or there. You know, I don't really feel like I'm gaining much, even though I am. And But um, for someone who's lost their job or something, obviously, they feel that more acutely. So what, what I was trying to say earlier is what economists have looked at is the overall gains to society. When you add up that $20 and $5, it's much more than the wages you know, that, that were lost. So you can compensate that person or help them um, get, go on to a new job. And we do talk about the efficiency of trade adjustment assistance, whether that works or not. That's in the report. Um, but that's where that theory comes with. So you're seeing the concentrated losses, um, which is, they're very real. They're very real. Yeah. Thank you. And thank you, thank you for your report, because I, I realize I've been, been on this committee for years, 
the amount of money that you're given to do the assessment <coughs> and what the expectations we'd like to have uh, probably a lot greater than what can be delivered. So from that standpoint, I do understand and thank you for the work that you did. I'd echo Senator Patrick's thanks because I know this is a considerable work product. And I have a confession. In Arista County, we've had two mass layoffs related to trade in the last month. So I've been very busy and I did not read all of the report. <laughs> However, so that said, that I agree with uh, Honorable Ms. Treat that, um, <laughs> that the, the statement that you can't lose the same job twice, it does it does jar a little because I think we have seen workers in Arista County kind of fall down the economic ladder with job loss after job loss and you retrain and that job goes and so that is that's that's tough to swallow. I just but, want to clear, I'll definitely rework that. I obviously didn't mean not obviously. I certainly did not mean a si one individual cannot lose the same job twice. Right. We've seen that over and over. You know, the paper mills, they close down, they reopen, people go back, they close down again. I meant as a state, if we've lost 50,000 manufacturing jobs, it's not like we can go through that again. I think so I'll reword mean, that. Yeah. When you refer to pockets of losses, but it's, we trade some harrowing losses for a $163 net benefit, you know what I mean? So my specific question is about um, Section 5, where um, you summarize that our service and agriculture sectors will experience small increases and the TPP will reduce the growth of manufacturing, natural resources, and energy. And I spend a lot of time with CWRI data, so I know that basically in a nutshell, we're going to experience small increases in the lower wage sectors, and we're going to experience flat, flatness, a lack of growth, in what are high wage sectors in Maine. Would you agree with that? That is, okay, so a couple things. So um, in this, in their definition of sectors, services is huge. Okay, so manufacturing, as I said, that's about 10% of uh, wage uh, workforce. Agriculture is about three. Okay, so just to put that in perspective. Um, and uh, you're right that in services includes retail trade, food services, lower income, but again, it's also the higher income. Yes, right now manufacturing, their average wage is higher than um, uh, overall than in the service sectors. It's so it's not. An hour. Yeah, it's mm -hmm. yeah. So, and, but it's not, um, it's a slower growth, just so you know. So it's not an absolute reduction, it is slower growth. So you're interpreting those correctly, it's just. So for so, me, working in, in workforce development as I do and dealing with the um, aftermath of mass layoffs, that's the main takeaway from the report for me, plainly stated that we're going to see slower growth in higher wage sectors as a result of the TPP, and we're going to see small increases in demand in these low wage sectors, and already through 2022, we have most of our new jobs created are projected to be in very low wage sectors, mm -hmm. so that is concerning to me. Yeah, I don't know if I need this, but I shared uh, Sharon's overall reading of it. Uh, uh, and it seems to me the elephant in the room is two mains. There's northern and western Maine, uh, which you participate, in which John pa uh, Patrick participates, and in which I participate, uh, is the northern and western Maine. And then there's southern Maine. And I took a look at page, as I was reading through this, pages uh, 67 and 68, it shows the impact in the six categories you lay out in the employment category per capita is so small that you can't even register it. We get, we get six dits there. Um, and I guess the other thing is, um, I understood what you were trying to say when you said Maine cannot lose the same jobs twice. I had to reread it to really understand what you were saying. But I do think you probably ought to uh, change how you ca characterize what you're trying to get across. You mentioned it in your summary, you mentioned it here, and you mentioned it in your presentation. Um, the other thing I found hard uh, to come to grips with is when you say uh, U.S. consumers uh, get more income to spend uh, because there's lower costs uh, involved. It seems to me they've got the same income to spend. Uh, they may have more disposable income, but you don't get more income because low-wage countries ship in stuff to, to this country. And um, 
when you say roughly two thirds of the service positions are in the middle of high wage business, health, and education positions, do you mean by wages or by number of employees? By wages. By wages. Oh, wait, wait, no, about two thirds. That's number of employees. It's number of employees. Yes. So you're saying one third of the people in service are low wage, and two thirds of the people in service are high wage. You know. Okay. And the other thing I want to say is I I, I concur. Uh, quite a bit of work went into research uh, in this. Uh, in the, uh, Linda, doing proofreading, I tend to pick this stuff up because I spend a lot of my life, a lot of my professional time doing that, and I like to report overall. Catherine, I have a question. Um, seems like we're beating up this two thirds uh, uh, part of your report, but. I just have a simple question. Uh, I'm not going to get into a long dialogue, but uh, you mentioned that the manufacturing sector has taken a big hit, and we've lost a lot of manufacturing jobs, and we've gained a lot of service sector jobs, which are obviously overpaying. <coughs> but you also say, state in the report that you anticipate other areas of the economy taking uh, a hit with the TPP in the future. Did you uh, did you come up with any areas of uh, what those uh, sectors might be, or is it just a general statement? Um, um, areas that we could be expected to see more job losses. Uh, in the back, I would say manufacturing, a so slower growth manufacturing. in manufacturing. Yeah, and then um, USITC. That's why uh, I made a few comments about. I'm um, sorry. So where you would find that would be in the last section. Um, first, when you look at kind of the broad sectors, agriculture, manufacturing, natural resources, and energy, um, and then services. Um, and as Ms. Staggett pointed out, yes, it's in the manufacturing, natural resources, and energy sector where you'd likely see um, an impact. Again, uh, similar to the, the impacts that we've seen in the past, just of a much smaller magnitude, because we're talking about much smaller marginal changes here. So knowing that, it appears that we're all mainly going to take another hit. Because that's where all that other stuff is. Yeah. Uh, 